It was instilled in me at a young age that these are things to enjoy. Certainly something that's been passed on. Were it not for the efforts of a dedicated group of conservationists, there wouldn't be a Warm Springs Rapid, and there wouldn't have been any opportunity to go back and look at the history that happened there. Warm Springs, to me, demands a lot of respect from river runners. You know, I'm not sure how I started on the Yampa, but it's just one of those experiences for me that, uh, you know, I can't give up. Yeah, there is no feeling like dropping into a rapid. Each of those experiences will be unique. Anytime you come down here, you don't really know what to expect. You know, you're not really a boater until you have a big swim. But that's where it happened to me. The Yampa is, it's the last. It's like an endangered species. In 1965, on the Yampa River, Warm Springs Rapid was nothing. It was just a minor riffle that nobody even ever commented about because it was such a small rapid. There was a, just a little drop and a few waves. But in June of 1965, a big storm developed in Utah and started moving east. Huge thunderstorm. So as the storm moves east, June 10th, 1965, there's all these, these uh, various trips on the Yampa River that don't really know what's going on. The first one to see Warm Springs Rapid was uh, a private trip with George Wendt. First of all, it was just really interesting to go back up and look at the amazing debris of boulders. We spent some time marveling at the fact that we had survived the night before. One of the guys on the trip, a guy named Bruce Julian, commented how there was an old cabin there right by the spring. And he was in there for a few minutes and it was just as wet, he said, in the cabin as it was outside. So he left the cabin, went to find his friends who were a little bit downriver, waiting out the rain, and they heard a rumbling sound and it was, they said it was just like freight trains. It was this incredible noise. And they looked and all of a sudden, here came the whole hillside. Once I realized what we had witnessed, I mean, it's a formative experience for me. I mean, I've thought back to it many times. I could have just been gone. And it wasn't just a flood, it wasn't just water. It was huge boulders and logs and trees and all kinds of things. And that cabin that Bruce had been in, five minutes later, that cabin was right in the path of that. But it was interesting to hear stories of people who were camped upstream and people who were camped downstream because they were very aware of the same amazing rain event. But it was really raining, the river was really high. And the next day we took off and the rain had quit and we were uh, above Warm Springs just floating along. And all of a sudden we see a small plane come down into the canyon. And it was actually Bus Hatch with some pilot. 
and he dropped us a note in the life jacket that told us that uh, Warm Springs had been made really bad. We went back down and the first group that came through the next day was a Western River rig and just the guy took it through and he did a good job but he was not able to land for about a mile. Just upriver, there was camped a hatch strip. There were two boats, two 27-foot um, pontoon military boats. Al Holland, who was one of the boatmen on the trip, had, um, had hurt his leg skiing and so um, a while ago, and he was still recovering, so he brought his brother Bob along to help him row and help him with the baggage and everything. And the other boatman was a guy named Les Oldham. Al had all the Boy Scouts, and he said they complained bitterly the whole time because it was just raining. They couldn't even cook because in those days they all cooked on fires. So they couldn't cook because it was so, it was raining so hard. They didn't see the evidence of the flash flood like the Western group had, and so they just ran into it, and he was flipped out in the rapid, and they did not find him. commented about um, how slow the water was. We commented about, uh, oh, here comes the thundering locomotive of the Great Rapid because we're trying to cheer up these Boy Scouts who are absolutely, abjectly miserable. And got down to the rapid where I could see the slick. Les was ahead of me because we were not anticipating anything at all. The last thing I remember seeing of Les was him pulling on his right oar to straighten his boat for the first big hole. But the first big hole was tricky. It was moving downstream. It's the most interesting water I have ever run. The holes were moving. We were there early enough in the river reclaiming its channel through the debris pile that it was resorting everything that had washed down. The boulders were booming, the big holes were moving. He straightened up, I have no idea how he went in the water. Nightmares for years, all kinds of different scenarios waking me up in the middle of the night. How did he go in the water? I grew up next to Hatch's boatyard when I was just a kid, and we were down there playing in their boatyard all the time. Bus introduced me into river running when I was about 15. Bus was one of those guys who would uh, go out and do an adventurous thing when most people wouldn't. They'd pick up guys that would kind of wander down to the boatyard and say, gosh, I'd sure like to try this. And uh, they'd say, well, we'll give you a try, son. When Bus Hatch and many people first started running rivers, they used wooden boats. And in a wooden boat, you could only get two or three people, and that became kind of a problem on a multi-day river trip. And when Don Hatch convinced his dad, Bus, to go to Salt Lake and look at the surplus inflatable boats, it was a big change in river running because, number one, you could carry a bigger load, more people with the gear for a multi-day trip. People designed all kinds of rigs from those surplus boats. So the inflatable boat was significant in bringing a lot of people down the river. And among those early groups was Harold Zanheiser in the Wilderness Society and David Brower in the Sierra Club on the Yampa River.
In the late 1940s, the Bureau of Reclamation decided they wanted to build a big dam in the middle of Dinosaur National Monument. and it would have flooded the Yampa River, the whole Yampa River Canyon would have flooded the green all the way up into Browns Park. And a real grassroots movement started to defeat it. And a letter writing campaign, that's when the Sierra Club got involved and they wanted to raise their consciousness. So they started putting together these trips that would go down the Yampa. They would have literally 125 people as an outfitter, they came to bus. He was the only person with the expertise, the only person with any boats. I've done Warm Springs enough times to know that, you know, it can be benign or it can be horrifying. And it all kind of depends on the water conditions. When you show up at the put-in, you never know what you're going to get from one year to another. It's always different. It's not like going to Disneyland or going to a dam-released river where flows don't fluctuate that much. This is a wild, dynamic river, probably one of the last dynamic rivers that I can think of. And that's the appeal. Whether you've been boating for 20 plus years or you're new to boating, the Yampa has that appeal because it's so raw and it's so natural. With that hydrograph, Warm Springs changes daily, and it becomes this monster of a rapid. At high water, at 26,000 cubic feet per second, Warm Springs has holes that'll eat Greyhound buses. It'll, it'll just blow your mind. And then at lower flows, when you're canoeing it, you have to portage it, potentially. And it's a mild, class three, mild rapid. One thing about uh, a river that's, that's free-flowing is you go down at different levels. Every level, the rocks are different. Every level, the rapids are different. And sometimes there are no rapids here, and there are other times there's big rapids. That's what's different about Lador. In Lador, almost all of the rapids are essentially stabilized now because they do not get big enough flows to push stuff through. But the Yampa is a dynamic river, and stuff is always moving around. The role that a dynamic river plays in shaping landforms and creating these unique habitats for native fish and native plant communities and great big cottonwood associations, all of that just is part of the Yampa experience. Experience is, is the thing that, that wakes up the intuitive side of learning. That undefinable, intangible element within our psyche and within our, ourselves that connects us to the rest of the world. And when they come out here and you get on a river like this and you experience it, you start to see the river as a river. Warm Springs, when you're there doing it, really lives up to its reputation. Your whole life is distilled right down to that. That instant, those two oars in your hands, your feet on the, on the bar, and your skills. There are a few adrenaline rushes like the top of a big rapid. So you want to be prepared. And to be prepared, you want to be running the rapid on the right side so you can get set up. And the water goes from calm to you know, mass acceleration all at once. But there's a lateral. You have to break through that lateral, and that's often the key. If you don't break through that lateral, you get surfed into the big wave train, and then you're basically screwed <laughs> because it's really hard to get out of it. That wave train leads down to a giant hole called Maytag. I think of Warm Springs as a rapid, I think about the wild Yampa River. After a big 
peak water flow and you get to the bottom of Warm Springs, you're high five your buddies, you're totally jazzed. I mean, it's kind of that wildness that you get from that connection to this wild river and wild rapid. The things I love so much about it are the things everybody loves about river running. I think I really grew as a person just by having the opportunity to flow down the Yampa River. We, we have to keep in mind that the river conservation movement really started on the Yampa. Let's learn from the past and see this thing through. Let's protect this river. Rivers have a profound effect on people's lives. Warm Springs Rapid on the Yampa River is so, so interesting and so full of history. It is a special rapid. Even at levels where I know this is a piece of cake, I'm still thinking, I wonder what it's gonna look like. This river, we need to respect it. Recreation is a really general term. When we talk about the Yampa, the recreational opportunity is to be here, to be on the river, and to really understand firsthand how the river shapes the land. We need to keep this place wild. That is a river I can fall in love with.